Okay, so let's go. Anybody has any idea what nuclear safety would be? Why nuclear safety? Why not something else? Any idea of any other safety? Traffic safety, aviation safety, maybe. We try to go through this and see, uh, see a little bit around. Just a few preliminaries. You can have my email here and you can get my secretary uh, on this phone. If it's needed, secretary will be the fastest response. Sorry about that. So we are in the COVID times. That's medical safety. It's again a safety issue. And safety, please relate it. Usually it is some rules connected with some rules. Somebody will tell you what to do, assuming that you don't or not everybody knows what to do. So safety is related to some kind of rules usually. Uh, might be uh, good rules or bad rules, but it's rules. If everybody obeys even a bad rule, it's better than a chaos. So uh, keep this in mind. Uh, please take care of masks. We are just full at the capacity of the room. 12 in 24, so I'm surprised you are squeezed so far, but okay. Somebody else said it's allowed, so it's allowed. Uh, if you have anything like symptoms or troubles with the testing or some relatives or friends who are in the testing, please stay at home. I'll do my best to do it over Zoom. So we are going over Zoom now. Uh, also, and I'm uh, also recording the session. I will try to record the session, so there will be somewhere on the internet for you uh, for a later uh, reference if needed. So it's much safer that you stay at home and do it later, then you come here, and then we all stay at home, okay? Uh, if somebody is tested, please, uh, and tested positive, please tell us immediately, tell me, I will tell uh, to the dean uh, of the school. So they have to start some procedures. We'll keep you then informed what happens, but please tell me. Like I said, lectures are live over Zoom. I have my department listening to me now also, and uh, they, they are recorded. Hopefully it will work, so we'll have recorded stuff later on. Okay, a few more things before we start digging into nuclear safety. There is a website with basic information on this project. For Slovenians, it's simple, it's Predmeti. And Jeva is Jedrska Varnost. This is a kind of a intermediate for Slovenian uh, speaking people. So in, in English, we distinguish security, safety, safeguards. We'll talk about it later on when it we are talking about nuclear. In Slovenian, the safe, safety is varnost and security is also varnost. Safeguards, I don't know if there is any translation. Uh, but you will see, you will understand the difference. Just some languages don't really uh, differ these things. I don't know for other languages. Maybe it's a good idea. We'll, we'll have some seminars uh, individual in about two weeks, then you share with us how it works in your languages. You can have separate words for it or not. So we will be posting there. You cannot see it here, but nevertheless, uh, the Zoom link, the slides, the today's slides are already there and the, the records of the lectures. Uh, nuclear safety is pretty indisciplinary thing. So we'll go uh, into not so many details, but uh, we will take care that the people who do different things within the nuclear safety will be talking to you. So I will go through the introduction, definition, legal frameworks, concepts, and something called safety culture. Let's say a little bit soft, not so technical, but soft terms. And then we'll have radiation, radiation protection with uh, Professor Damian Schkirk. Professor Schkirk is also director of one of the Slovenian two regulatory bodies. We'll touch upon what regulatory body is. Then uh, accidents, transients, deterministic safety analysis with uh, Andrei Proshek, 
severe accidents. Severe accidents is when you melt the core. Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, nothing much more than that. With Ivo Klenak, probabilistic safety analysis, and this will be a condensed course in one week. So four hours per day, the whole week. So far, we are planning week 7 to 11 of December with Andrea Volkanovsky. Safety documentation, quality assurance again with Andrei Proshek. And description of nuclear accidents, which already happened. So I mentioned it again, Chernobyl, Fukushima, Primal Island with uh, Professor Istov Kisle. Please note also that there will be a week of October 19 to 23, where there will be a specific part, uh, part course on nuclear materials. Again, each day, four hours. So for those coming to nuclear materials, this will be the, the week. For the rest, the certain certain activities will simply not be there because to give to give all the students opportunity to be where they need to be at that time. A few useful references, and please note the link here. You have it on the slides. It's a Google Drive, so you can download PDF versions of these books. What well, the International Atomic Energy Agency material is free of charge on the website. You go on this website, you search, you get the document. It's usually in English, Arabic, Russian, Spanish. You can play with the language you want. Also Chinese for those, anybody speaking Chinese? Perhaps you should learn. This one is not in 2020, but 2012, uh, Segal's uh, nuclear safety. And uh, for those who like the history, reactor safety study from 1975 is the first comprehensive study. So please, if you are interested a little bit in the history, how things went, this one is. Okay, and then towards the soft things like safety culture. We'll come to the safety culture, I think, in October, in the end of October with the lectures, but by then, Please, if you have time, oh, it's six and a half hours, but if you have time, look at the movie, Whiskey Romeo Zulu. You have it here on this. All, all the files are here. Just don't share it around. Uh, <laughs> take it from Google. So the first one, Whiskey Romeo Zulu, is very nice depiction of safety culture or bad safety culture. It's much easier to, to picture bad safety culture than good safety culture in the aviation industry. So it was, uh, it is a story of a pilot who didn't want to fly the plane because the plane was broken. So he was taken out and another pilot was taken in and the plane never took off. It just ended on the oil refinery at the end of the runway. It was a real event in 1999. So you can see the things developing much before that, how the people were taking the safety and problems, how seriously or non-seriously they were uh, taking it. The same is the HBO series Chernobyl. But in this one, because, we, because you are technical people, please start with number five. Number five is a reasonably good depiction of what really happened. And the rest is a kind of emotional stories about the circumstances, but very, very good depiction of how the circumstances lead to the social, psychological things which lead to the potential problems. We'll discuss it in two, three weeks time. It would help you if you can look at it. A practicality, another one with the examination. So you will have a lot of teachers, five or six of them. Uh, there will be a written exam, exam on deterministic safety analysis and probabilistic safety analysis. That will be part, Slovenian colloquy or something like that, with the people who will actually do that. So during the semester, you can take it uh, per partes. After the semester, then there will be an exam when sufficient number of students is around. And we would like to have two seminars with you. 
the first one will discuss the legal frameworks tomorrow so then you will have roughly one week to figure out the legal systems of your countries and tell us something now for slovenians we'll push some uh, details so that well or we, we can make experiment we can make experiment in the sense who already read a law i'm not very enthusiastic about anything a law a legal legal document not uh, not newton's law a legal document you did you did it okay two let's try to figure out what's going on okay <laughs> from the legal document i will give you some some frameworks what should be said there but okay maybe it's not okay and then we'll talk to each other so each of you will give uh, a seminar you are 12 in 90 minutes means five minutes uh, highlights would be excellent with some discussion not ma not much more than that so you need two or three slides and a nice message for the first one for the second one it will be a bit more okay now let's go to nuclear fission why would nuclear safety be very specific did you what well, what we are doing is we are producing electricity here okay or heat or electricity usually electricity but some future applications will be in the heat also probably so we are producing electricity also in other way like solar photovoltaic did you hear about photovoltaic safety yes what they what do they do what's the danger okay but this typically not where they are producing the electricity somewhere else okay not in the same place so we are mining what lithium somewhere in the south america or some things in china some things but we are producing solar electricity here uh, did you hear something about the the fossil fuel safety Are they safe to use fossil fuels? Sorry? Yep. Well, but emissions are different. So there are different emissions. There are some, some CO2. There are some more dirty emissions. There are particles. A lot of things come out. Yep. Yep. And this is also for Slovenians. We had to, uh, uh, but for you, uh, for you, if you, uh, non Slovenians, if you travel a little bit, how if it's possible, there is a place called Trebole. We invested in 300 meters high uh, chimney. So the, the uh, gases out of the coal used for production of, of electricity went to the neighbors, uh, to the neighbors, not to this wall, but to the other wallies. Uh, this is, of course, called safety in one valley, but not in the others. OK, just to make it very clear here, whatever we do as, as a living species makes some consequences. So striving to do nothing that we cannot live and we cannot survive, but we should strive to minimize our impact around. Uh, so that's one of the things nuclear safety is trying to look into. OK so you know about the nuclear fission who doesn't never heard about nuclear fission how how it works fine the essential part is energy and another essential part is fission products so we put a neutron into fissionable nucleus it will fall fell apart give us some fission products give us a lot of energy and some new neutrons to create the uh, chain reaction downstream if you can collect this heat energy comes out of this reaction as heat and put it in a typical thermo thermal power station you can heat water vaporize water that's the typical technology what we do today and with uh, a wave vapor you run the steam turbine 
a steam turbine runs the electrical generator. And typically you get what one third of the heat goes to electricity and where go, go the other two thirds of the heat. Any ideas? Hmm? Yep, atmosphere or rivers or in the environment. In some very limited cases. In the Eastern European countries, that was a, a typical thing. In Western, from nuclear, they didn't really do it much of it. Probably economy or complications, safety related complications, also to some extent. Actually, it's difficult to control the system of district heating by the plant. It's nearly impossible. So, okay. You know that real typically, at least for, te for technologically uh, useful purposes, we only have three uh, nuclear fissile uh, materials and only one of them, uranium-235, is actually around in the nature. The other two needs to be produced. So thorium is done by neutron capture from uranium-233 and plutonium is also uh, taken by neutro neutron capture from uh, uranium-238. Anyhow, depends what you look at. We are good for hundreds of thousand years of energy with the uh, uh, resources we are aware of today. Another one, the fissile products or the spent nuclear fuel. Well, the, the, the things which remain after you have the chain re reaction are radioactive. So one part of it is fission, fission products. And this is the typical, the typical schematics, what comes out of uranium-235 in red, uranium-233 in green. Nevertheless, this is atomic number. And you will see that like strontium, zirconium, technetium on this side, and cesium on this side. These are, uh, these are atoms which are smaller than uranium or the, the fuel. And then you have also quite a lot of transuranium elements. So there will be a, a accumulation of neutron captures and the, the atomic number will grow over 238. They have two uh, not very good properties. One is ionizing radiation. All of these things decay naturally. So they will give out some radiation and they will give out some heat and this heat needs to be taken care of. Uh, ionizing radiation is already a safety concern. So in the first row, you would like to prevent the workers to get, to get some consequences. You know the drill of alpha, beta, gamma and Newton radiation and what can stop them. So alpha, the, the helium, uh, nuclei will be stopped by paper, beta, which is electrons, usually with some aluminum foil, gamma radiation will need some lead uh, barriers and concrete. By the way, the, and water is also very good for gamma and neutrons. You have any feeling how much water do you need between a working nuclear reactor and you to survive without any problems? How much water is this? More, more free, about five is quite okay. One is a little bit low. And another thing we'll touch just in a second is actually very, very, very high energy density of nuclear fission. So uh, the good news with energy density is you don't need a lot of mass to produce uh, a lot of uh, energy, but the bad news is you have a lot of energy in a small space, so you have to take care of it. Uh, so if you have a trouble in a reactor and the, the materials go out of the reactor, the radioactive materials goes out of the reactor, you can have very serious health uh, consequences in the workers and also in the population nearby the nuclear power plant. You might remember Fukushima, there was 
quite fast evacuation to get people away, residents away from the nuclear power plant. Some people say today it was it was unnecessary, but uh, let's keep that for the lectures. Just sometimes it's good to run, you know. It's it's also basic psychological response we have. It's fight, freeze. If you are, if you would encounter a bear somewhere in the forest, you would either freeze or fight or flight, three things. So flight is a good, sometimes a very good strategy. Okay, a common, uh, On the energy density, just to give you some idea. So these are uh, megajoules per, per kilogram. You have batteries, lithium ion batteries and zinc batteries very close to zero. Technically, if you buy a Tesla car, you will get about 100 kilowatt hours uh, in a battery weighing 500 kilograms. If you go to diesel or gasoline, you will get this 100 kilowatt hours out of roughly 12 or 13 kilos of diesel, okay? So it's already order of magnitude better. Uh, chemically, the best is here far away, an order of magnitude again, nearly order of magnitude uh, better than, than diesel and gasoline is hydrogen. Now, what does it mean practically? If you look at the diesel or jet fuel is also diesel, basically, in an airplane, the mass of the fuel is about one third. One third is the structure and one third is the, the cargo or the people. If you want to go out of the, of the earth gravity uh, field to the orbit or to the moon, you cannot do it with diesel because the mass of the fuel is already too large for the energy it provides. You have to go for hydrogen, okay? And now, fissile materials are six order of magnitudes better. We were talking about what, 100 kilowatt hours in one five, five kilogram Tesla battery. You know, 100 kilowatt hours is also all the energy you need per day. Everything, each of us. So in 10 kilos of fissile materials, in only 10 kilos, which is roughly half a liter, you will get 100 kilowatt hours per day for the 80 years of your life, okay? The good news is you only need 10 kilos of uranium. The good news is also that you will only leave 10 kilos of waste after, after you use this but the bad news is it's tricky to handle. Okay, with this introduction, we can go to try to, to put some definitions around to give you an idea of what which words mean. So there is nuclear safety. There is nuclear security and there, there are nuclear safeguards. Three different things. Some people call it 3S. Don't replace 3S with 5G or other uh, dangerous technologies. Don't do that. Uh, and then we need safety usually if there is some danger. So we'll try to see what is a danger. Uh, those nuclear guys are very, very, uh, in the history, they were not very fortunate with selecting the words. I will try to comment that on the go, but these words are around and they are meaningful to the professionals and sometimes really frightening to the general public. Risk and fear will try to, to make a few stories about that. And then we'll also try to determine what would be a deterministic and probabilistic analysis. 
now deterministic and probabilistic any ideas let's keep the rest the rest is tricky what would you see in deterministic or probabilistic or what would be the difference any ideas in real life forget the nuclear at the moment <laughs> Okay, but people are also, there is a probability of people dying. There exists a problem. Let me argue a little bit. You can also count probabilistically. Okay. Okay, yep, we'll go a little bit different in the in the sense whenever you are doing a deterministic thinking we usually assume that probability of it happening is one that's where you you were heading so it happened so let's look uh, um, we assume it happens or it will happen like uh, An interesting example of prob probabilistic thinking, and it's it's a fake thinking. So be careful what I say now. Is this one? So what do you think? Uh, what? How large is the probability that somebody will bring a bomb on the plane on the same airplane you are in? Is this a large probability, a small probability? Or... What do you say? Should be a small probability. So now, uh, is the probability of having two bombs on the same plane larger and sm or smaller? Is the same or smaller? Much smaller if the, the events are independent. Okay. Now, because if the events are independent, uh, if I take it other way around. So if the probability of having two bombs on the plane is much smaller than one, then I bring my own bomb with me. That reduces the probability of having the other one. So there is a way to increase the probability by thinking. OK. And these definitions are now a little bit on purpose tedious. Yeah. So we'll try, I'll try at the end of the, of the discussion to give you a very simple definition to be remembered. Uh, but, you know, I already mentioned that the nuclear professionals, we are usually very, very awkward in communicating with the public. And we are also using the, the wording which scares people away very much. Now, look at the first one, and there is a nice, a nice booklet, which I recommend when you are get, get lost in all this nuclear wording mambo jumbo. You have IAA safety glossary uh, on the website. And there is also a, a, a glossary of English and Slovenian terms. I will give you the link, uh, which was compiled by Slovenian Nuclear Society some time ago. Uh, this one is a little bit uh, more interesting because if you would like to read some of these documents of IEA, you need the glossary sometimes to figure out what they meant. It's very simple that, well, let me read this. The achievement of proper operating conditions, prevention of accidents and mitigation of accident consequences resulting in protection of workers, the public and the environment from undue radiation risks. What are the difference between undue and due radiation risks? Okay. What would you recognize as undue? undue? It implies that some are good or some are acceptable and some are unacceptable. Where do you think this limit is or how do you look at it?
depends on the situation, of course. If you go to the medical doctor, they put you on, on some CT or magnetic resonance. If you are a little bit more unlucky, they find a cancer and you go to radiation treatment and you will receive a lot of radiation, which will be uh, given to you as a medicine. Here we say everything which was not necessary for the process is kind of undue. Uh, so uh, typically, and I think you will, you will go into this a little bit more in detail with diamond curve later on, but typically, let's say the background radiation around here is about 2.5 millisievert per year. In some countries, it could be much more. I, typically, Finland is much more and because of radon from granite. Uh, and the, the uh, nuclear facilities are allowed to add, even in some pretty serious conditions, about one millisievert per year, in addition to that. If you go to a CT scan, full body, it's about 20 uh, millisieverts immediately, just for a, for a reference. So a nuclear power plant can contribute only one per year. And if you go to the medical facility, you will get more than one by walking around. Okay, so in different different documents, you will have a lot of uh, long definitions, trying sometimes to avoid the point. The other one is from the safety fundamentals, uh, and it for the purposes of this publication, safety means the protection of people and the environment against radiation risks. This is pretty much consistent uh, with the first one. Uh, it's only not trying to say how to do it, which we are not today. We are not trying to say how to do it, just what it is. But they say the safety of facilities and activities that give rise to radiation risks. Safety. Uh, includes the safety of nuclear installations, radiation safety, safety of radioactive waste management, safety of the transport of radioactive materials, and don't usually does not include all other non uh, non nuclear safety. What would be a non nuclear safety problem in a nuclear power plant? If you are a worker there, what would be a danger to, to you which is not nuclear related at all? It must be the same in coal fired plant if it's non nuclear. Any examples? Electric shock, hot water, or hot steam, falling downstairs. But for this, you need a high level building. <laughs> okay. And what would be, again, what would be the nuclear risks or nuclear dangers you are exposed? From radiation, radiation, yeah. Direct exposure or contamination, if you eat it or take it into, into your body, then even alpha and beta particles will be, will be pretty harmful. If you're there outside, usually not, but if you take it in, could be a problem. Now, Sorry? Yep. But that's not good for people. It's not even good for steel, by the way. <laughs> the nuclear, the, the neutron irradiation to those on the on the Zoom. Yeah. I probably have to repeat the questions or the comments to those on the Zoom sometimes. Okay. But now let's turn around the question. Is irradiation or potential irradiation, could it be a problem for workers in, in a thermal power plant? Oh, yeah. You burn the coal, so the CO2 and H2O go away, but there is a lot of heavier elements which remain there, and some of them could be radioactive. Naturally radioactive. Uh, as long as they are in the in, inside of the pile with a lot of, of carbon and hydrogen, they're okay, but then you condense them by getting carbon and hydrogen uh, 
in the atmosphere. Okay, what's also important here is the last one. Safety is concerned with both normal circumstances and accident conditions. Okay, what one can say if you are behaving safely, then there will never be something like accident condition. That's a, long, uh, there's a similar uh, uh, story as the two bombs. So I'm behaving safely by bringing my bomb. Can you say if I'm behaving safely, nothing will happen? So what then you do? You behave safely and you take care because you're not perfect or nobody's perfect, okay? You still have to be in the position to figure out something is wrong and act accordingly. Good. Let's see what comes next. Oh, let me just say this is to, to remember. Nuclear safety is to protect people and the environment against harmful effects of ionizing radiation. I guess for the techno freaks like you are techno freaks, I go a little bit deeper and will go much deeper in these things later on during the, these lectures. There are technically only three things you need to do in a nuclear power plant to keep it safe. Control the chain reaction, control the reactivity. If you don't, you can have a Chernobyl. Then you can you have to remove the heat from the reactor and from the spent fuel store. And here the heat will come to the residual heat. The natural decay could be very critical. We'll talk about it a little bit later. And the last one is to confine or contain the radioactive material behind what we said before, five meters of water or two meters of concrete. If you can do that, two meters is not a lot of concrete, five meters of water is not a lot. So if you can do that, you're safe. Okay, and then also, well, if something goes out, still, if you are very careful, but something will go out, then try to shield or evacuate. Do you know what are the three rules of avoiding exposure to uh, irradiation? Time, shielding, distance. What are the three rules for COVID? The same. <laughs> so it's not a rocket science at the end of the day. Huh? <laughs> Okay, and just before the, the break, let's try to see also what would be the uh, residual heat. Actually, if you look at the uh, fossil uh, power plant, you shut down the burner and there is no more heat, okay? If you cook your coffee or you cook something on the stove, you switch it off, there is no more heat. Can't do that with a nuclear reactor. So in principle, you will have in a steady state reactor about 93% of heat coming from chain reaction and roughly seven from the natural decay of what we said, fission products and transuranium elements on the top of the, of, the, of the food chain, on the other side of the food chain. So we can stop this one and we cannot stop decay. Decay will go exponentially down forever. That's why they say maybe, maybe well, one of the reasons for the, the spent fuel to be in isolation for 10,000 years is the heat. Another one is, of course, radiotoxicity. It goes together. So if there is a natural decay, you have some radiation and you have some heat, both of them keep you in, in, in the dark. So, uh, you know, Kershko has two gigawatt thermal power. So when you switch it off, you are faced with about 140 megawatts of heat. What can you do with 140 megawatts of heat? Anybody knows what is the power of the Ljubljana district heating? 
100, 20, 40, 20, 30 megawatt thermal. Much smaller than that. Of course, it's exponential. It goes down very fast. But still, after a day or so, you are at 10 megawatts. And 10 megawatts is still comparable to the district heating. You have to be able to get this, this heat out of the reactor more or less forever. Okay. That's Fukushima. They couldn't do it. And five, what, 15 minutes break at this point. Okay, so we continue after a short break. break. There is another point uh, which we'll have to touch a little bit for you just to be aware it exists, is the nuclear security. So there is another glossary by the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's nuclear security glossary, which you can download if you'd like. But this one is about possible criminal activity related to nuclear materials. Now, you know, there is, that's not really only for something which is in nuclear power plant. There is a lot of medical uh, stuff, um, isotopes to be used in the medical treatments around, which needs to be transported around. So there is a product production facility somewhere for medical isotopes, like usually it's a reactor or accelerator or something like that. And then you have to bring this in certain time depends a little bit on the half-life uh, to the medical facility and uh, there are some industrial uses of different isotopes like i think it's cobalt 60 has a very nice gamma radiation it, it's used in similar fashion as uh, rentgen uh, waves in industry to see through materials and to figure out if there is something wrong and stuff like that so there is pretty uh, maybe much more than you could expect of transportation of different radioactive materials around, which could be taken uh, for different purposes by the criminals or terrorists or people with not very good intentions. So there need to be certain type of security associated with them. Not only safety, safety would be a cask, cask around, around cobalt, for example, which will stop gamma radiation for those who are, who are taking it around, uh, would be on the safe side of the story. But there is also security in the sense that sometimes there is police around taking care of this. And uh, sometimes the security is also a um, pretty important part of the nuclear power plant security. Now, uh, a little bit on the interesting side of things. Uh, also, a military attack on a, on a nuclear power plant could be a security uh, problem. And certain security pro problems, like military attack on a nuclear power plant, could also result in nuclear safety or radiation exposure. OK, that's why this is uh, connected typically connected, but when also this is typical police business or, or security forces or secret service, people like that would be involved in this type of assessment of, uh, of uh, taking care of this uh, stuff. Uh, now, there, there were examples of not really, I don't really remember somebody would do something very bad on purpose so far, 
I don't remember such a case, a public case, but it happened a few times, uh, especially I think it was Mexico and other South American countries. People find a radioactive source uh, somewhere on the street. You don't feel radiation. It's just a nice, shiny piece of material. They put it in the pocket, they go away, and they get pretty much radiation damage on the go. And it's not very easy to find them because, you know, it's a, a tricky security problem. How do you find this piece of material and how do you prevent too many people to be irradiated? Uh, and there is another uh, to be on the story side of the things. You are probably too young to remember the year of 91. But in the year of 91, there was a potential military threat to the Kershko nuclear power plant in Slovenia. So it was the first nuclear power plants in the world under direct uh, operating one, under, under direct uh, military threat. It happened, I think, once that Israelis did, did destroy something in Pakistan, uh, um, a nuclear power plant in construction in Pakistan, also in the 90s, 80s or 90s. Uh, but the, the Pakistani facility was without the nuclear fuel. So it was not a nuclear type of incident. But then here in Slovenia, when Slovenia was going out of uh, Yugoslavia, there was a threat for the nuclear power plant to be attacked. It's probably not the best thing to do because, you know, there is a containment of one meter of concrete and then it's a lot of concrete structures around the reactor. So it's not very easy to come in. But you know, people try a lot of things. Well, <laughs> Uh, yes. Well, the question was if attacking something else would be more efficient. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Um, we will come to the perception of risk and fear. Uh, it's not really uh, it's not really necessary to put people really in danger. It's enough to stimulate the fear, and fear of of radiation is very effective. <laughs> Maybe not very dangerous, but very effective. <laughs> okay, nevertheless, that, that was uh, uh, one of our colleagues, the former director of the Nuclear uh, Safety Administration, the regulator in Slovenia, he said, well, the safety is protecting people against nuclear materials and security is protecting nuclear materials against the people. Okay, to easily remember the difference. Now, there is the third, the safeguards story. We are talking fissile materials here. What can you do with fissile materials except producing heat? Or a dirty bomb? You don't need a fissile material for a dirty bomb. You need just radioactive material for a dirty bomb. And dirty bomb could go to the security stuff. Thank you for this question. More to the security, it's only dirty, only radioactive. But if you have fissile material, and there is fissile material in Kershko, there is uranium-235, there is plutonium-239. It's not very easy to get it out of the fuel still, but it is there. Uh, do you know how to, how to get it out? Sorry? That's for the for the new uranium. You you get you get separation of two three eight to two three five, but when you burn the fuel, there is still some remainder of two three five. Maybe one percent of two three five will be still there, and there will be more than one percent of plutonium in the fuel at the end of the of the cycle. They even they even run the the let's say in the last months of the of the fuel cycle in Kershko, they will run maybe thirty percent on plutonium actually. So. Uh, it's not a breeder reactor, but it breeds a little bit of, of uh, plutonium and burns a little bit of plutonium. <laughs> so technically, you can get this fuel, and French people do that, and uh, Russians do that, and, and uh, I think also Japanese do that, and US, they did it also. You can take this fuel to a factory, you can cut it, get plutonium and uranium out, scrap the rest, and recycle the fuel 
they call it mixed oxide fuel like plutonium and uranium 235 go in a new fuel and you operate now if you can extract plutonium and uranium 235 then what you can do except nuclear fuel nuclear fuel burns slowly can it burn very fast And safeguards is about preventing that civilian materials, nuclear materials, go into military use. Okay. We'll discuss it tomorrow a little bit on the legal aspects, but in principle, it's international. It's specifically explosive. So we are only concerned here with fissile materials. The dirty bomb, you, oops, you know. <laughs> so, uh, this is not really a police business because the international community does not trust a national state like Russia or United States of America that they will they will not do it okay so this is international control people come if you, you will go to the reactor to the reactor to the practicum I think most of you uh, to our research reactor, you will see there are cameras there looking all the time because there is a little bit of of uh, uranium 235 in the reactor. Uh, they will be in principle chasing each gram of material. Where it is? Did you take it away? Did you? Now, how much of, of uh, uranium 235 you need for a bomb? Ten, roughly. And plutonium, roughly five. So, uh, yep. Then calculate a little bit in the nuclear power plant of what two gigawatt thermal heat, thermal power like Kershko. There is about 50 tons of fuel. If at the beginning there is 5% of uranium 235. How much is 5% out of? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If, well, if you manage to put about 10 kilos together, it should explode. The problem is, of course, that uh, you have to keep it together very, very, very strongly. To get the effect if you cannot because there will be immediate a lot of energy will be will be released and it will try to go away apart and if you go so apart you lose the you lose the power you, that's explosives to put it together and to keep it together for a while okay uh, but uh, i was somewhere else um, so we have we have 50 tons of uranium and five percent of this is uranium 235 how much uranium 235 do we have in a in a core? Calculate. Is it two tons, two and a half tons? But you still you have to enrich it to, to 99% to be mean, meaningful. It's it's spread around, so it's not useful. But in principle, you have enough material there. If you get, if you play with chemistry and with something, you can. No, I'm not aware of, not in my time. But you know, most of my time, there is no Yugoslavia anymore. <laughs> I started in 86, Yugoslavia went away in 1990. There are rumors, some people were chasing small bomb. Yeah, but floor chemistry is also uh, used to, to centrifuges. You know, you, you need a gaseous version of uranium to get to get it enriched. To, that's one of the ideas. Okay. To shut down the nuclear safeguards, uh, it's prevention of using civilian nuclear materials as military explosive devices. Say again, it's not very easy to do it. It's theoretically possible, and there is international. Uh, 
we don't have enough electric power. The French, no, no. The French recycling facility, I think they need about four gigawatts of electric power. So there is a, a block of nuclear power plants there. The Slovenian total capacity is roughly two gigawatts electric, electrical. So we have to import uh, another two gigawatts, which is technically possible, but it's really, it's theoretically possible, but it's not very easy to do it, okay? <laughs> Still, there is international control doing it. And in Europe, there are two independent controls. One is Europe, Euratom contract. Uh, Euratom treaty is one of the European Bay, uh, cornerstones they they want to do it and the international atomic energy agency wants to do it and they do it istok istok tell me in my in my uh, and you, i will translate uh, yeah veshka it is the 4 gigawatt so imeli dokler so delali the centri the the diffusio Zdaj, ko delajo pa z centrifugami, je pa tu enih, meni se zdi, da nekaj desetkrat, morda celo petdesetkrat manj energije. Tako da centrifuge so precej bolj energetsko učinkovite kot difuzija. Tako da tisti obrat, mislim, da so ene par let nazaj zaprli, francozi. Ok, uh, uh, I'm recording this, so your question in Slovenian is in the... Is in the... <laughs> in the notes. I'll try to translate it a little bit. Istok, uh, Professor Tisl says that uh, the, the four gigawatts was the previous technology with, uh, with uh, diffusion. Now they are using uh, centrifuges and it's much less, maybe 10 times. Sorry. So then we nearly classify with all the electric power we have. Without lights, keep this in mind. And only on a very sunny day where the, the photovoltaics is working. <laughs> Good. Now let's go to some other definitions. We solved a little bit or any immediate still question about safety safeguards, security. You have a feeling how it's divided. Okay. We'll deal with the safety most of the time in this subject, just for you to know that there are other issues. Okay. Now, this is the triangle now of hazard, risk, and fear. If we are trying to be safe, let's say that what we do with safety is trying to minimize the risk. We'll see what risk is. Not necessarily the fear, or maybe also, but okay. Let's go slowly. Uh, the hazard is something which is to me very, very unhappily uh, chosen word in nuclear. We'll discuss it a little bit. But what nuclear people think about the hazard, it, it's a potential for harm, okay? If you sit in a car, what would be your hazard? Other cars, pedestrians, bad weather. And that's, that's a potential danger which could or not realize. And you don't really speak about the magnitude of this, this danger. So, if you are in a very large car, then only the car of the same size or larger are serious hazard in this sense. Smaller cars are okay, or bicycles. Ah, no. <laughs> it's the question of the of the of the mass and or of the of the momentum here. Now uh, in my understanding of the of the word hazard, it puts into my ears kind of unresponsible play with the dangerous things or risky things. So when I was young, especially in Slovenian uh, language, the hazard or somebody dealing with hazards would be somebody gambling very, very, very much. Okay, so he would on purpose go into the danger because of his uh, well, on purpose or not very responsibly, at least, if not on purpose. And that's not what we say here. This is a potential danger. It's not yet a danger, it's potential danger. So it's a good safety behavior. If you go somewhere, you look around, okay, I don't need umbrella today, fine. That's 
a hazard is I will be wet. If this hazard becomes a risk, let's say that there will be rain, umbrella might help. Now, examples of hazards are related either to the location, like earthquake. Probably you're here, if you, if you, not, somebody says nuclear power plant, uh, they, they generate what, what? Uh, I don't have a nice picture here. So the trigger reactor, our research reactors, generates double rainbows, you know. And the serious reactor, like the one in Fukushima, generates earthquakes and tsunamis. Is that correct? No. But it's earthquake which is a danger, potential danger to the to the to the nuclear power plant. It's a tsunami, it's fire, either inside or outside. It's high winds. I'm still not convinced about the high winds. You know, if you if you put a, a, a bunker of of concrete, high winds are not really. But okay, it's there. Aircraft crash since 9-11. Failures of safety equipment. And th there are two, let's say, two really, really um, potential dangers we focus in the nuclear safety. One is core melt. You don't want the core to be melted until it's intact. You can, you can uh, remove the heat and you can control the reaction and you can control, you can contain it. If it got melted, and this is because of the, of the residual heat, there's enough residual heat to melt it, you know, if you don't, don't uh, uh, really uh, chill it. And when it gets uh, molten, then you start losing, losing the defense. It can come out or will part of it can come out and this what comes out is large early release. Large because it's dangerous to people, early is because you couldn't do the evacuation on time. That's why it's called large early release. It's a term. If you have a late large release when people are away, that's, that's reasonably okay. Uh, but we are talking here hours. If you can get, if you can get significant quantities out of the nuclear power plant very early, within hours, then the evacuation could not really be successful, at least not in part. So these are two dangers. We are trying to figure out the ways to defend against them. And also what we do, well, hazards are there as a list of dangers we have to be aware of and try to figure out the defense. Then we are safe. What would be uh, a defense for tsunami, for example. Yeah. Any simple seawall is a good defense for tsunami. Any simpler defenses for tsunami? <laughs> well, close the door. <laughs> but the door must be water watertight, okay? It worked on, on submarines for hundreds of years, so it, it works. Okay, hazard. Now, the next stage is risk. I'm a bit unhappy again with the definition those guys in the, in the IAEA provided, but mathematically it's correct. So it's the risk R, X kind of expected value uh, if there is an event with probability P and consequence C. Now imagine you have a dice and you have to pay to me 1000 euros if you throw free. What is your risk? To throw free, the probability of this is one in, in six. Okay, so you multiply one in six with 1,000 euros, and in average you lose uh, this uh, one sixth of 1,000 euros. Uh, because nothing has a probability one or zero, in average there is always a consequence, okay? 
Now, I think I have some, yep. These are some graphs out of, of the year of uh, 75 from director safety study called WASH 1400. So we have the probability or frequency of event per year. And this is the number of fatalities. Now fatality is a good, well, it's not a good consequence, but it's a consequence, a measurable, a measurable consequence of an event. So we have uh, something like fires here, air crashes here, dam failures, air crashes with something uh, else. With well, This one is chlorine releases, by the way. But what you can see is that the probability of large consequences is usually very, very small, okay? So the events, um, Usually we have we have to we deal with events we, we, which have large probability and small consequences. So then you can play play the game with this. Do you do you accept this consequence? That's the question always. Can you afford to accept the consequence? Or this one is fatalities and frequencies. Well, earthquakes, tornado, uh, natural events. You see the earthquakes are quite quite persistent. They can they can have large, large consequences still at some reasonable probabilities. Now, huh, a feeling of a probability, if something happens to you with 10 to the minus two, what would be 10 to the minus two, 1% per year? Can you imagine an event? Sorry? Car crash, I think it's smaller than that. Well, one of the problems we have in the perception is that we are not really defined or, or made to, to understand small numbers. We react to 50-50, definitely we react to, to 80-20%, maybe to 10%, but we don't really react in, 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 uh, in uh, our, without really doing the math. Instinctively, we don't see 1%. We don't care about 1%. It's so small, it doesn't matter. 10, 20% maybe, okay? But still, uh, those guys calculated, this is the curve for 100 nuclear power, power plants. And they say with the probability of 10 to minus seven, seven per year, they will kill less than 1,000 people. Never happened, actually. I don't think nuclear killed much more than 3,000, 4,000 people in all the nuclear accidents until now because of radiation. Okay? You don't trust me? Look at the numbers. Very little. Bombs, a little bit. But even bombs, they didn't kill by radiation so many people. They killed by heat, by, by pressure wave, but not really uh, with radiation. So. Uh, how many uh, a consequence of, let's say, uh, Chinese coal mining would be in terms of fatalities per year? What do you think? How many Chinese people die digging out coal in a year? A few thousand each year. How many Americans died of COVID? in the last six months. Sorry? Yeah, maybe 200. The order of magnitude. Okay, there is, yep, yep. Yep. Yep, I'm not sure I can I can make a curve on this. I will try. That's a laser pointer. Now this one. Let's try this one. This will do something. I think it will be something like that. 
if you look what really happened. So the, the frequency of having, having a nuclear accident, it's a little bit larger than anticipated, not very much, um, but the number of people killed is much less. Now, there is one representation. What, what is the, uh, that if you buy the lottery ticket and you win, what would be the typical uh, probability of this event? Or one in 100,000? Slovenia, one in a million, then everybody has to buy the, the lottery ticket and we don't do that. But okay. Uh, and uh, another one in the order of one in million is, uh, well, not now because the, uh, the airliners are not in the air, but before, the, before COVID, there was typically about six, five to six million flights between one fatal accident. Takeoffs and landings uh, were in millions. So your chance if you were sitting in the airplane was in the order of 10 to minus six. The cars, I think, is between one to minus three and one to minus one. We'll have a data for the lifetime at some point. Okay, let's move on. This should now. Sorry. I think I did. Ah, here we are. We still have the, the, the draw the drawing there. We survive. Clear. Great. And this is summary. If you look at all man caused events and all natural events, and natural events are more, they, they tend to have much larger con consequences still than, than man made events, at least in the 75. <laughs> and you see uh, the nuclear power plants that, that's property damage. It's dollars, not, not fatalities now. Uh, and now, the, the, you know, this, this helps a person or, or a government or somebody, if you have a curve like this, to decide, okay, the cost or the consequence or the danger uh, of having 100 nuclear power plants is that with uh, 10 to minus 6 probability, we will lose 10 billions at some point. Now, 100 nuclear power plants on the other side, they generate typically 1 million of euros or dollars revenue per day. So then 10 billions is not such large money if you look at 100 nuclear power plants operating for 100 years. It could be, it could be seen as acceptable loss, a potential for loss, okay? It could be in the 10% of the money you will gain. And 10% sometimes is a good uh, measure, okay? My computer is still thinking about moving on. Ah, now fear. Fear, F word, fear makes us it's in us for, for, for the entire evolution, okay? The fear is the basic defense mechanism you have in, in the nature. Uh, it's beyond, so it does not trigger our rational mind. It's automatic. I have a nice, uh, a good friend uh, who does, uh, uh, thinks uh, a lot of, of thinking in psycho psychotherapy, and he says like, it goes this way, the fear, or the basic mechanisms. You see a bear and you see a fence, okay? The, your slow mind, the rational mind, starts to figuring out, tries to figure out where the bear is, behind the fence or in front of the fence. And it takes a few seconds to figure it out. But your uh, old animal brain, amygdala, says immediately, fight, 
flight freeze immediately. Does not really take, take um, uh, it's a bear, so you better go away, forget about the fence, <laughs> okay? And this is something we, we were developing through the, through the entire evolution and it worked actually, so far it worked. Maybe in new technology type of conditions, it's wrong, but so far it worked. So we rely on that very heavily. So it's vital response. Now we'll try to connect the fear uh, to the risk and to the, to the hazards because we intimately are driven by fear, not by the risks. I can bet that most of you, even if you calculate that your risk is acceptable, you can still fear to do it, <laughs> okay? So to understand the, the other people around us, uh, when they don't understand what's going on, and even if they would understand, it's still the, the primary fear they are, okay. That's what you would like to do, okay? You would like to produce electricity or you would like to, to go to a beach. Uh, these are, let's say, two selected related hazards you can face if you are at some exotic beach. You agree? One is the shark, another one is a coconut. Both can kill you, that's the consequence, okay? Now, the statistics, the probability says that coconuts kill roughly five people per year and sharks also kill roughly five people per year. And the consequence is the same. The risk is the same. Which one you fear more when you see it? Who is for the shark? Who is for the coconut? Well, one did it on purpose, but it's kind of 11-1. Eh? That's one example. So the fear for the shark is high and fear for the coconut is slow. The numbers tell you it's the same. Let's turn it around. You would still like to be on the beach, but there is no beach in Ljubljana, so you have to go there. You have three modes to go there and each has related hazards. So you can go by car, you can go by motorbike, you can go by plane. This is the statistics for the US. I took some numbers, it could be a little bit different. This is, so it's a lifetime probability. That's 1% in a lifetime, you will be killed in the car crash. It's one promile in your lifetime or a little bit uh, less that you will be killed in motorbike accident. Most probably because not everybody is driving motorbike, but still probability to be killed there is an order of magnitude nearly lower. And there is huge discount on the troubled probability if you fly. So only one in 200,000 would get killed by flying there. The consequence is again the same. And now I would nearly bet that without these numbers, you would say, or most of the people would say, airplanes are highly dangerous, motorbikes are the next, or maybe the worst, and the cars, they are the best. Okay? So how we see the dangers, how we perceive it uh, in, our, in our mind, and how it really unfolds, is different. Uh, typically, let's say that technical and, and uh, science people, they would tend to rely on numbers and they will try to figure out the numbers and they will calculate and they will say, okay, that's acceptable. They will still be intimately afraid of taking the airplane, <laughs> for example. Although the statistics says, okay, uh, that doesn't matter, but still some people are afraid of taking the airplane. And so in the general public, you can always expect that they will be afraid of the wrong things. But it's not stupid. It's, it worked for two billions of years, okay? We wouldn't be here without that feeling. <laughs> so difficult to say it's stupid, 
but it gives you some perception why uh, people go for for easy story that why uh, why people don't trust nuclear but they trust photovoltaic for example although photovoltaic is not much better than nuclear might be worse in the numbers and so on not necessarily Uh, yeah, two points came out. One is fear again uh, of unknown to some extent, and maybe not. And another one, being in control of things, usually gives people a feeling they can do it. So if in, that's the, the explanation of the airplane. You have a professional pilot flying, but you assume I would be better than he is. Huh? <laughs> in the car that works, in the airplane, maybe not. Maybe, huh? let's try. <laughs> Did you try it? Any? I took once in China, I had the opportunity to sit in the Boeing 737 simulator and try to land. I, I was able to take off, that's easy. You just sit and wait for the, for the speed and then you say, oops. But coming down was really pain in the ass. So, no, in the second round, nearly. <laughs> So I crashed on the on the runway. In the first round, I was before the runways. <laughs> there was a the progress, okay. <laughs> now the the unknown uh, problem. Yeah, maybe maybe not. There are some studies saying that actually, when we, when it comes to what we believe and what we fear, it's our social circles which prevail. Uh, are more important than, than uh, the facts or the science. And then the people who are more able to find scientific evidence, they are always able to find the evidence supporting what they already believe. So if your friends, let let's me illustrate that, if most of your friends or family are afraid of nuclear, then you will probably not really dare to say to them, that it's not dangerous. You will try to be with your friends. That's more important for you than the, 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 the scientific truth about nuclear. That's a kind of, uh, again, one of the psychological uh, treats. So it goes for political parties also the same. If your friends are mostly left or right, then you go with them and whatever they say, well, sometimes you say, okay, it's not everything gold, what's shining, but they are my friends, so let's keep. So uh, these uh, numbers and fears have a deep rooting. It's, it's different. Okay, two more definitions and then we are done for today. One is the deterministic. Now let's pose the problem first. If we have some risks, and we would like to be safe. We have to develop a defense against this risk. And then we have to figure out either the probability or the consequences or the product should, should be less than what we would like to pay. So now this dies with three and 1,000 euros. Um, now, if we say, if we rephrase the problem, if you throw free, you pay 1,000. If you throw everything else, I pay 1,000. Now you play in this case? Probably, but you can also lose. Yeah. <laughs> so then you, your risk becomes a little bit, uh, the, uh, the, your consequence becomes much better for you, or, or at least you perceive it as much better for you. So for a deterministic analysis, we assume it will happen. Okay. So uh, the airbag in your car is a consequence of deterministic thinking. There will be a crash, and after the crash, the airbag will slow down your body in, in kicking into some uh, structures, okay? That's the probabilistic thing. That's a deterministic thing. So we skip the probability, we set it to one, and figure out what happens and say, okay, if the consequence is less than what, what I would, uh, like or I would accept, then let's go with it. 
the probabilistic thinking is different in this way that you really go with probabilities of the crash in this case. And then if there is a crash, if the um, airbag can deploy or not deploy, and then for all possible crashes with the probability of something, you figure out what is your consequence. So it gives you the probabilistic approach a little bit more feeling what's going on, which are real dangers, but both of them give you an idea or measure if you are within the acceptable consequences or not. Now, why is this deterministic probabilistic story important? You will have a lot of deterministic, uh, 10 hours of deterministic analysis and maybe 10 hours of probabilistic analysis on the go. And you will figure out the difference in, in approaches on the go. What is important to say now is that if you talk to the regulatory body and you need to talk to the regulatory body if you would like to have the nuclear power plant, it's like your car. If you would like to have it registered, you have to show it to the technical station and they have deterministic criteria. So your lights work or not, okay? Your lights probably work. It's not, it's not a good idea in this case. Um, so in talking to the regulatory body, you have to show things deterministically, but in real life management of nuclear power plants and so, they would go probabilistic because they, it gives them a little bit more space, what is important, what is not important and so on. Okay, in summary, three definitions on nuclear safety, security and safeguards. The safety is to protect people and the environment against radiation or nuclear materials. The security is to protect materials against people. And the safeguards is to prevent use of peaceful radioactive materials as weapons. Okay, then the hazard is a kind of potential danger or threat, not really happening, just to be aware of. Risk is then a kind of product of probability and consequence and gives you an idea if the, this event is justified compared, compared, of course, to the consequences you are willing to, to, to bear. And fear is not really mathematically related to hazards and risks, but is our physiological reaction to the dangers and could, could be completely off the analysis. And in summary, again, the deterministic approach would assume that event is happening or will happen and develop a defense. And the probabilistic analysis will not always develop a defense because it might show that the probability is so small that we don't bother, okay? probability that an asteroid will fall on the nuclear power plant is larger than zero. You would agree with me. Now, in most countries, it's so small, they don't bother. But if somebody would say, okay, this is a very important uh, hazard, then we'll have to figure out a way to protect the nuclear power plant or move it to another country where it's not a real hazard. Thank you very much for your attention, questions, comments. See you tomorrow at 12.15 then. Thank you.